with government and therefore with legitimacy of government. Um, can also show that corruption reduces social welfare and um, places additional demands on the resources of the state. Um, so for that reason, it's also going to be having an impact on uh, the legitimacy of democracy. Corruption has been shown to have a disproportionate impact on the poor, um, and it increases uh, thereby the concentration of wealth and power, and that has been shown to undermine interpersonal trust and support for democracy. And then finally, the last point there, I think it's pretty obvious, is that corruption uh, can support crime and law 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 lawlessness, which makes people uh, less secure and can reduce their support for the system. The next slide is just, um, I think, pretty good visualization of this impact between corruption and democratic legitimacy. This comes from the Latin American Public Opinion Project of Vanderbilt University, which was funded by USAID. Uh, in their research, um, they found that corrupt corruption victimization was the biggest driver of uh, reducing the legitimacy of government. And that was even ahead of um, crime victimization and ahead of things like um, a person's income and whether or not they voted for the government in power. So this was uh, somewhat surprising and a very clear correlation um, that these opinion polls pointed to. Um, now what's interesting is, at least from, from my reading of um, Michael Bratton's recent article in the Journal of Democracy um, analyzing data, similar data from Afrobarometer, um, it seemed to show a similar effect of elected leaders, um, or at least the percep perception of elected leaders being corrupt um, and monopolizing available resources, that, that would have a negative effect on their perception, on people's perception of the extent of democracy. Um, from his presentation this morning, we saw that um, that paying a bribe um, increased satisfaction with services, at least to some extent. And um, also, I mean, the, the numbers were fairly small, but there was uh, seem, seemingly um, an increase in the extent of people's satisfaction with democracy. And um, my, my take on that is that um, that's proved presumably because services did improve after people paid a bribe, and that would, to, to me, suggest that the wording in the opinion polls is very important. Um, the opinion poll used here was stressing uh, the victimization. Um, clearly, um, you know, if people are more satisfied after paying a bribe um, in, in, in some of these African countries, it doesn't really suggest victimization so much. At least that's my take on it. Um, then we can uh, turn the arrow around and say, okay, what is the impact of democracy on corruption? Uh, would we likely to see, you know, this virtuous circle? Um, if we're going to democratize, we're also going to see corruption levels falling. Well, I think a lot of people um, are very optimistic that that would be the case and very hopeful in making that argument. And certainly the um, theory would suggest, yes, that there would be a positive impact from democracy to fighting corruption. And democracy does, in fact, you know, provide this framework of horizontal accountability and vertical accountability. You can think of being able to um, throw the corrupt leaders out by electing a new government. Um, that's considered like sort of a hallmark of democracy and vertical accountability. But of course, there are those other mechanisms of horizontal accountability, which many think would be strengthened. Um, with with democracy, so um, see, seeing that that would in fact be a positive relationship. But on the other hand, as many of us have seen um, all too often, democracy can provide these new opportunities for corruption, especially um, in the electoral arena, where <clears throat> there's a lot of bribery that can go on um, between the voters and uh, the candidates for office, and then of course trying to to secure uh, campaign financing can be a whole, can, can open a whole, um, a lot of opportunities for corruption as well. Now, if we want to just look at um, just raw correlations um, across the board between democracy and corruption, we see that, okay, they are uh, negatively correlated, as you might 
expect. But on balance, the sort of the pro uh, that we were talking about in the previous slide um, might dominate. That is, um, if a country in general is uh, has a bet, has a higher score uh, for democracy and higher, um, I'm using Freedom House score, so higher on this slide would be on the left, would be would uh, correspond with the number one. And it would tend to perform better in corruption, and I'm using the Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, in which the higher score, in that case 10, would be um, a better indi indicative of better performance on corruption. Um, but, but clearly, what this shows is there's a lot of variation. It's, um, it's not straightforward. In that whole uh, kind of middle category, I'd say countries um, in the, with a democratic score, say between two and four, um, a lot of them fall even below um, that line. So they're, they're performing less well on the corruption front than you would expect given their level of democracy. And then you have some countries, um, say in the four to five and a half category on democracy that are performing above the line, that are actually doing better on um, fighting corruption than you would expect. You have a, um, we have a point there where it's uh, four and a half or so on the democracy score, and it's above nine on the corruption perception index. I think a lot of people would be able to identify what country that is. The outlier is uh, Singapore. Um, but if we, if we go back to the um, to that sort of y-axis there, where countries are um, in that category, in the free category, um, according to Freedom House, they received a score of one. Um, there, I mean, you still see that um, those, by and large, are the countries that are going to do significantly better. If you're, if, you're, if you're a country that's aiming to have a corruption perceptions index, say, above six and a half, you um, would really expect um, you do far better if you were in that category of three. But um, actually, I mean, in, that, in this uh, simple correlation, um, as you can see from that R squared on there, where the line is, and you know it's not very strong. It's just down around you know 0.36. So it doesn't it doesn't really capture um, a lot of the variance here. What I think might um, help to explain the, the relationship a little bit better is um, Michael Johnston's syndromes of corruption. He um, he wrote about this in a book um, that was published in 2005. And it tries to identify the syndromes of corruption, and it, it breaks down these categories, um, the political and economic categories, I think, um, with a little bit more nuance. So for instance, um, a lot of the countries that we'd see in the previous slide that would be characterized, characterized by Freedom House as free, having that score of one, um, actually uh, might be put in two different categories in terms of um, the syndromes of corruption that he's outlined. Some of them might fall in that first syndrome, the influence markets, and some of them might fall in that second uh, syndrome, the elite cartels. In the influence markets, um, Johnson would say the institutions are generally well established and they've been developed over time and the capacity of the state and civil society is extensive. So there tends not to be um, very much in the way of everyday administrative type corruption. Um, and there's more, there's more though, in the, in the way of, um, say, political or grand corruption. And um, in this case, you have, um, you have countries performing much better in terms of the, that corruption perceptions index here. The average uh, is 8.1, really quite high. Versus the, um, the elite cartels, where you have um, what he characterizes as these interlocking groups of, of politicians, um, business figures, bureaucrats, military and ethnic leaders that um, share corrupt benefits and solidify their power. Then you have the bottom two categories. You have, um, he distinguishes between um, the oligarchs, he calls them oligarchs and clans, which have this um, transitional, uh, transitional democracies and new markets, and you have, um, it's very much characterized by these insecure elites which are building extended personal clans to um, quite often exploit the state and the economy. And then finally, on the bottom, you have official mobiles where you're not having much in the way of political or economic opening, um, but the officials can still try to exploit society and economy. In both of those bottom two categories, the 
corruption perceptions index is quite low, as, as you would expect. So if we move beyond this discussion of uh, um, the relationship more you know, broadly between different type pol political systems and corruption profiles and, and sort of step back and say, well, what are the underlying causes of corruption? We can kind of come up with um, some different categories. On the left, you see um, heading institutional. And this is where most of the emphasis on fighting corruption usually falls, and for good reason. I mean, there's something you can do about it, uh, usually in, a short, in the short term. And they also can, um, these, some of these institutional causes can have a serious uh, impact on corruption. So think about the three main categories here. Uh, the first one is uh, wide authority. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And that the, the notion here, if we're talking about public sector corruption, and that's pretty much the emphasis of uh, my presentation today, is that um, the more activities that public officials control, the more opportunities there are for corrupt behavior. It's just, um, it's kind of simple. If you, if you have the opportunity, it doesn't mean you'll necessarily act on it, but if you don't have the opportunity, you can't act on it. Um, and then the second box gets at the notion of little accountability. And, it, and that's kind of a broad category. It includes things like transparency. So it's, we're talking really about the probability of detecting corruption and also of punishing it. Um, so if you have, if you have measures uh, like transparency and oversight that um, allow corrupt acts to be detected, and then you have uh, measures like within the judicial system of um, imposing sight of of um, bringing people to justice and imposing sanctions, um, then that, that provides a very different sort of uh, system for imposing accountability. Um, then um, on the bottom, you have the box called perverse incentives, and that gets a little bit more specifically at, at, the, at the measures that are being used um, to um, incentivize um, more or less ethical behavior on the part of the individuals working in the government institutions. So, I mean, it's interesting. Things like meritocracy has been shown to be a very big predictor of corruption levels across uh, government institutions, say, within a country. Um, so meritocracy could, you know, is, is, is one important element of incentives. Just things like um, salaries and um, benefits, uh, rewards for performance, and professionalism, uh, uh, whether there's a uh, fear of losing your job, all those sorts of things contribute to the individual's decision whether to uh, partake in corruption or not. So then um, on the other side, I've listed societal causes of corruption. These, I think, are um, intuitively um, um, logical, but they're often not very well teased out, either in the literature or in sort of uh, specific recommendations about how to go about fighting corruption. Um, I think, I, I think um, we often see some of the conditions listed here as working in tandem, but they can be present to different extents in different countries. Um, things like widespread poverty and conflict can create situations in which um, orders, uh, the, like order and rules are challenged just by the need to survive. And um, often in those, con in, in those contexts, you have things like um, family or tribal, ethnic, religious, uh, political loyalties creating systems of patronage in which, is, uh, in which advantage is given to mem members of a specific group. Um, then the notion of illegit illegitimate government, I think, uh, the, the extent to which people perceive their government as lacking legitimacy, um, whether it's due to repression or ineffectiveness or some other factor, can create an atmosphere of distrust and disregard for laws and rules. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, uh, the dominance of a ruling elite, elite um, can create an atmosphere in which the advantaged think they can operate outside the law because they have that, um, they have that dom because they are sort of changing rules to, uh, to their advantage, but, it, but as well because the disadvantage see the, um, that happening, they also think that they can operate outside the rule. So what does this mean in terms of uh, ways to respond to corruption? Uh, in general, um, responding to some of those institutional sources of corruption that uh, were identified on the left in the previous slide, 
Yeah, it's very, it's, it's kind of clear we would pursue reforms that reduce those opportunities for corruption. Um, and what does that mean? That can involve policies like um, simplification and streamlining of processes for things like getting a license or a passport, reducing uh, or eliminating import quotas, tariffs, those sorts of things. Deregulation could be another piece of uh, reducing certain kinds of opportunities. Um, the second bullet there gets at that whole notion of improving accountability, so you would increase transparency, oversight, and sanctions. That's where a lot of the institutional reforms that you hear about that are often called anti-corruption reforms come out, things like freedom of information, um, uh, working with supreme audit institutions, attorney generals, um, changing the laws, so you're criminalizing corrupt acts, working with um, judiciaries to make them uh, more accountable, less corrupt. Um, as well as things like publishing rules and procedures so citizens have, a, have an understanding of what they're entitled to and how procedure, how systems are supposed to work. So oh, it's, a, it's a huge range of activities that would fall into that second bullet, um, ways of increasing accountability. And then finally, on the bottom, the real and incentives, which as you imagine, gets at things like um, improving meritocracy, um, providing some kind of a living wage, and professionalism, those sorts of um, those sorts of changes in public administration. Now, in addition to those sorts of reforms that we think of as being primarily the purview of the government, um, there's a range of uh, uh, reforms that seek, would seek to mobilize civil society and the business sector and the media. And um, it's, uh, I think a lot of the anti-corruption work in the past 10, 15 years has really pointed to the fact that you can't have um, effective, sustainable anti-corruption reforms that just focus on um, changing some of the institutions that you really need to bring in um, sort of non-state actors um, and enlist them as stakeholders and partners in this effort. And co these kind of coalitions are, are seen as the most effective way to make these changes and sustain them. So um, what that body of institutional reforms doesn't necessarily get at is some of those broader, um, what I call societal causes of corruption, many of them being economic. Um, um, and this slide uh, just tries to sort of lay out what, what are some of the ways that you would try to address those sources of corruption. You know, clearly, increasing development is a way. I mean, we, we've seen in most cross-country studies that income levels, GNP per capita, are seen as the, the best predictor of corruption levels. Um, you know, that's not a very easy policy prescription. I mean, I think a lot of countries would like to just increase their GDP per capita, uh, but it doesn't necessarily uh, happen quickly um, and, and have the immediate impact on corruption. But it is something to think about, at least um, regarding things like alternative livelihoods and post-conflict settings. That can be an important element in, um, in thinking about ways to reduce corruption. Now, um, emphasizing government effectiveness would be another, um, another important measure for trying to reduce corruption. Um, you can think of it as creating a virtuous circle where citizens are more likely to abide by, by rules when they're actually seeing um, seeing the government providing things that they want, uh, particularly security or essential services. And then the final one, uh, not so easy necessarily, but uh, we, we heard a lot about that this morning, um, the notion that decreasing concentration of wealth and power um, is actually good for anti-corruption. Now the next slide just um, is, is something that is drawn from the World Bank. This is their way of characterizing the many different dimensions of fighting corruption. Um, on the top, the two boxes there, on the left you have institutional restraints on power. Those are really the, those uh, horizontal accountability um, measures that really get at that accountability I was talking about before. On the right is political accountability. And uh, that's sort of the vertical accountability, which does bring in the, um, the elections. And then uh, and civil society participation is certainly being another piece of that, that uh, connected to the vertical accountability. And um, public sector management on the bottom, 
is certainly uh, gets at some of those perverse incentives when you're talking about uh, reforming the civil service, but also talking about reforms, basic reforms to sectoral service delivery and uh, working with financial management. And some of that is, is actually about transparency um, or about opportunities for corruption. So there's a lot of those different concepts from the earlier slide that get embedded and picked up in different ways in this configuration. And I'm not showing this in order to confuse anyone, just it's a more way of trying to say whatever uh, makes, you know, whatever makes someone's work easier. I mean, sometimes it's better to, to, look at, um, to look at a slide like this in terms of figuring out how would you go about addressing corruption. Now, one thing this slide doesn't necessarily show you is things like what I was talking about before, economic development and um, improved equality as anti-corruption measures. And nobody really talks about those as being um, anti-corruption measures, but in a way, in a way they are. So, last slide, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about some recent experience on the democracy and corruption front. Um, this is looking at countries in, um, in Eastern Europe, and it's looking at the change in corruption levels and democracy scores, that's again using Freedom House scores, um, in, uh, between 1999 and 2006. And the, the way that countries are ordered on the bottom is alphabetical in terms of the first 10 countries. That includes the eight countries um, that the, the eight, first 10 countries are the EU accession countries. They're the eight that joined in 2004, plus Romania and Bulgaria, which just joined earlier this year. And then you have the other four countries from the Balkans. Now, um, you know, in a way, you could say the numbers um, tell a pretty good story. They seem to confirm what theory was, would predict. In other words, very strong, um, strong link between the changes in corruption and the changes in democracy. The R squared are actually just very simple. So the R squared is 8.87. That's really high. Um, what this slide doesn't have, of course, is um, the GDP per capita. And you would predict, or you would, you would assume that that would be a very big um, driver for um, both the, the change in democracy that you see and the change in corruption um, on this slide. But um, the, you know, as, we, as uh, I think most people know, the EU accession process uh, requires the accession countries to adopt the EU's legislation and policies and standards, um, which you know, create a more coherent um, and accountable government. And we also, um, the, the whole process really increases the amount of aid that's given to these countries um, uh, in order to help them catch up to EU standards of living. So w with all that going on with EU accession countries, you would expect um, that, yes, the, the democracy would be increasing, um, standards of living and GDP per capita would be increasing, and corruption levels would be going down. So in a way, um, there, there's nothing surprising about this. In a way, it's sort of... Um, an, uh, an affirmation that um, the theory is working at least to some extent um, in these countries. And uh, for look at the uh, World Bank's analysis of these countries in their report uh, from last year, Anti-Corruption in Transition 3. It also shows another way in which evidence is supporting theory. Um, it was showing that the accession countries uh, have progressed further in reducing administrative, so the day-to-day -day corruption in other countries in the region, but they continue ha to have um, they continue to have difficulty addressing grand corruption, sort of the political corruption, and that gets back to the um, Michael Johnson syndromes piece I was talking about before, where the, those influence markets, the ones at the very top. Um, uh, have lower levels of corruption overall, but they still would be more characterized by political corruption as opposed to the day-to-day -day administrative corruption. And I think we might be seeing that with these EU accession countries, that yes, corruption levels in general are falling, day-to-day -day administrative corruption is falling, but um, political corruption continues to be a problem, just like it is for the OECD countries. So, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you.
I will speak about the process of uh, and the role of civil society in the process of transition to democracy in Peru, particularly in the case of uh, the introduction of democratic reforms such as citizens' participation in the broad uh, field of decentralization. And if time allows me, I will do some mentions also and the uh, access to public information law that also was part of these democratic reforms. Uh, six years after the downfall of Fukimori in Peru, the results of two governments, two democratically elected governments, have not been able yet to uh, produce um, uh, changes that would have an impact on the people's opinion about the democratic institutions and, and um, the, um, the ways they get related to the government uh, and also in corruption. The levels of approval, of the citizens' approval of democratic institutions is at the lowest historical levels ever heard in Peru. Uh, at least 60% of the people think that corruption is still present and uh, is still a serious, the, one of the most serious problems and a, um, a, a, a problem especially affecting the possibilities of development. The ways the people um, <clears throat> relate to governments in order to present their demands and promote their interests are not yet institutionalized, so they um, express themselves mostly through uh, social movements, in, in, in fact, uh, as social conflicts. The Ombudsman Office reports that in the period between September 2006 and August 2007, there is 12 months right after the the, uh, the new government of, the, uh, of, of, of Garcia, you know, the number of active conflicts, that is, conflicts that uh, are direct expression with uh, mobilization and all that, were in this period of 265, which is exceptional given the fact that this is a new government. Hmm? Um, what, um, do, what can we say about this? Uh, situation. In the first place, that it is, it must be considered within the process of transition to democracy. And I think this is very important to mention because it is sometimes assumed that the transition to democracy is a short process that ends up or at least has a, a, a key point of, uh, of, 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 of achievement with the uh, restoration of democratic elections. However, this uh, transition of democracy should be understood as a process and as a conflicting process, as I will mention in, 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 in a minute, and it is, in, especially in our countries, of long traditions of authoritarianism and patrimonialism, uh, it must be seen as a process of long as a long-term process. Mm -hmm. and the fact that in Peru, as in many other countries, uh, with, trans with similar tr or, or transitions to democracy, uh, is, uh, is initiated in a way uh, with a great consensus sort of accord between political parties, in social and, 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 and institutions such as the Catholic Church and other churches, you know, and uh, uh, NGOs and other big political stakeholders such as entrepreneurs associations, you know, that uh, they sort of agreed that anybody who would come into office, anybody that would come into office, um, in the first election after Fujimori, you know, there were several tasks to be accomplished. Among them, 
a series of democratic reforms that would expand the capacity of civil society to and, and, and citizens to participate in, in general governmental processes. However, you know, in this context, the agent called to assume the, to, to, to assume the, the, the most important responsibility of the political parties. However, I say the political parties were embedded in a long time crisis of capacity to be responsive and representative to the citizens. And this has been uh, a long process that even preceded Fujimori's uh, assumption of power in 1990. And this is a one condition that seems to be very important as a limitation for the process of transition to democracy. What I want to stress in this um, uh, speech is that uh, in Peru, because of the situation of crisis and, and democracy with no positive results in change of attitude of the people, um, the, um, the, the, these democratic reforms have resulted in Peru as an incomplete and somewhat frustrated uh, democracy. What we want to stress is the fact that the traditional political agents, particularly the um, political parties, and uh, have been unable to uh, utilize these uh, ref uh, democratic reforms to advance in deepening uh, the roots of democracy. And on the other hand, you know, the, these democratic reforms have affected negatively the power that usually and traditionally was held by bureaucrats and authorities. Um, and this is because the democratic reforms, uh, they blatantly open new spaces of conflict when the citizenry when civil society is granted with new rights of participation, hmm, this means that a new political arena is opened, and as most political arenas in a democracy, they imply the, the possibility or the right of the people to express their preferences in contradiction with others. So democracy is in itself the, 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 the realm of conflict, hmm? the possibility of uh, creating and implementing, making real the uh, democratic rights depends then on the possibility that the uh, beneficiaries of these democratic uh, reforms, this, that is to say the civil society, is strong enough as to uh, combat the resistant authorities, political parties, and bureaucrats. In the second, um, um, in the second place, these democratic reforms, however, generate high expectatives. That is, people see or perceive that the exercise of these rights can be very important in the improvement of their lives in development, both personal as local and regional. And in the third place, it seems to be important the fact that um, the opening, uh, the, the introduction of uh, reform, democratic reforms uh, create opportunities for the people to uh, intervene in politics. What I want to say is that these opportunities are particularly um, are grounded in the approval of democratic rights on the one hand, and on the other hand, on the implementation of these rights. In other words, what I want to see is the role that civil society has assumed in the ap approval and implementation of the democratic rights, in particularly the theme of
uh, uh, participatory budgets in decentralization. My contention is that civil society is the only, especially on the, 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 the poorer sectors of the society, is currently in Peru the most important stakeholder and defender and sustainer of the democratic rights. Hmm? Because both authorities, bureaucrats, and political parties are not, are, are, are not compromised, do not have political will enough as to uh, um, develop them. The way things happen, and I'm not going to tell the story, but uh, I want just to put three uh, big um, factors that affect this process of struggle of civil society for the approval and implementation of democratic rights is, in the first place, the first factor I want to uh, mention is the, the way the um, uh, democratic reforms are introduced. In the second place, I want to use the concept um, of structured political opportunities that comes from City Tower to uh, explain uh, what are the basic elements of the context in which civil society operates. And in the third uh, place, I want to use basically McCarthy's um, uh, concept of resource mobilization in order to uh, consider the, uh, the conditions or the strengths and weaknesses of the civil society organizations in this struggle. Um, decentralization was uh, one of the points of consensus that agreed at the beginning of the a transition to democracy a process uh, was to be implemented by any new government that entered into office right after Fukimori. And uh, there was uh, not only a long-term demand from regional movements, but also because it included in most of the versions a key element that was um, not absolutely new in the politic in, in, in the Peruvian context, but it was uh, generating a, a great expectative, such as the uh, participatory budget. Mm -hmm. The Peruvian Congress mm -hmm. approved the law of, 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 of decentralization, uh, including the participation of civil society in the participatory budget, and it took um, on, on the one hand, the experience of Porto Alegre, as we know, in many other countries, but also, and this is very important to mention, the experience of local government participatory budgeting that had been in, 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 in place in Peru even from the uh, 1980s, when the municipal reform started. And this is important because this was a tradition that was created as a result, this ex the previous experience of participatory budgeting, it was a result of the consensus between local authorities, you know, mainly from leftist parties, you know, the United Left Coalition, and a vibrant civil society organizations. I call this uh, way, uh, the, the, this way to produce democratic rights, this uh, consensus between authorities and civil society, because it's a result of a negotiation process, a participatory process in itself, the consensus over what rights, what, is the, what are the contents of the participation in local governments. Uh, this was not the case, however, in the law of regional government uh, and the decentralization law, because what the Congress did was discuss with very scarce or non-participation of civil society organizations, you know, and they decided to uh, establish the participatory budget in, one, in, in, in the whole country, you know, both to regional, 
newly created governments, both in regional governments and local governments, no, under one single model hmm, that was a universal model in, that didn't make any consideration of heterogeneities and uh, diversities, which is probably one of the most important characteristics of Peru, hmm, its diversity. And this single model, you know, of course, took um, uh, was the result of a very complex negotiation between the parties in the Congress and between those who were pushing for participation in, in, in budgeting and those who were opposing that were very important and had a lots of power. The process went on and the final result, uh, and, and the final result was a very limited and, uh, let's say, um, conservative way of legislating this uh, process, mm, this uh, participatory budgeting. So there were a lot of leakages, ambiguities, and uh, rights with no sanctions that limited the possibilities of the um, of, of, of a really democratic participatory budgeting in regional and local governments. And so my contention is that this opens the necessity to introduce reforms to deepen the, the, this right and at the same time to create uh, the possibility of variation in uh, an adaptation in regional and local uh, governments, which is a big challenge now. And the second place, I want to mention that the uh, civil society organizations discovered that a new structure of political opportunity was opening uh, because of this new right and because of the presence of important allies. Mm -hmm. And these allies, uh, which is uh, the, fact that the, the fact that I want to stress, is uh, are basically uh, NGOs and, uh, and, and the Catholic Church and international aid agencies which have been promoting this uh, support to, in, uh, so that civil society organizations at the grassroots may improve their capacities, which were poor. So uh, my impression is that the most important role there um, in, 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 in resource mobilization is this presence of allies such as NGOs, um, uh, Catholic Church, uh, and an institution called uh, Mesa de Concertación de Lucha contra la Pobreza, which is a public-private uh, institution, a very strange institution, in fact, in Peru. And uh, these are the, the, the particular features in which the struggle of civil society to mobilize the resources in order to uh, uh, take advantage of this new structure of political opportunities in order to improve the conditions of implementation of real participation in the participatory budget law and in our democratic rights you know, are the uh, most important elements that uh, characterize this uh, role of civil society. Well, I want, just want to end up saying that uh, nowadays the uh, role of, of civil society in the implementation and approval of these democratic rights is perhaps the most important guarantee for the uh, deepening of the transition to democracy process in Peru, particularly in the democratic uh, rights. And on the other hand, the big challenge is how these allies, which are, are crucial for the process, and uh, the NGOs, Catholic Church, international uh, aid agencies, you know, are able to empower hmm, the uh, civil society organization at the grassroots levels in order to 
compile them and turn the participatory and deliberative process of negotiating the participatory budget into a real uh, democratic right in full life. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for my English, which sometimes is not very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. We have a little bit of time, uh, about 20 minutes or so, for Q&A. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, a lot of food, food thought here, and, and across uh, you know, from Indonesia to Peru and and uh, the broader area of, of corruption. So I'd uh, like to open the floor if uh, anybody would like to. Uh, please introduce yourself first uh, for the recording. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Javier Vez Canseco from Peru, I'm a public policy scholar here in the Wilson Center. And I'd like to ask a question to Mrs. De Nino, dealing with uh, the relationship between uh, corruption and market reforms. In the Peruvian experience, the basic fund for corruption was privatization funds. That was the basic funding for the greatest and the worst corruption in our political life with Fujimori. And then, after that, we had, after helping the companies to private hands, you had what I would call legal corruption, specially made laws to uh, um, oppose, for example, the possibility of tax reforms, or to uh, uh, guarantee big private companies huge uh, revenues, no? and uh, affect what we have, for example, is a. Uh, 3% of the gross national product in education and less in health. Being a country that's growing 7% a year for the last years. So uh, what would you think on, on rethinking the relationship between market reforms and anti-corruption as sort of an always a, a strict correlation between both of them? Because in some experiences, it's quite the opposite. Thanks. We get uh, another question out there? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Dan Gans. Um, I think I'm, I'm taking more of a global look at what the speakers have said today and poverty, economic growth, corruption. These are all issues that seem to be central to everybody's argument. And what these are all very central to the Millennium Challenge Corporation as well. And I don't know if this is coincidence or not, but the fact that they're not here or the fact that their data isn't used, uh, I'm wondering if this is, speaks more to what the speakers think of what the MCC is trying to do or what their data does or doesn't tell you. Uh, I think it's just a general question that, you know, it seems that it's the newest uh, foreign aid assistance mechanism that's being used by the U.S. And I wasn't sure if this was a, merely a coincidence or there's not enough historical data that they use to support your analyses. Uh, if, if someone or could speak to that, that'd be great. came from USAID. My question is for Phyllis. Um, your graph in which you had uh, the corruption perceptions index on the y-axis and then the Freedom House score on the x-axis, and then you had the, uh, the, the line that sort of went straight as if it sort of seemed to sort of slowly, this, this relationship kind of slowly decreased over, over as you went uh, out to the less free countries. But in fact, it looked like the way the data was uh, bunched on the slide that only when your Freedom House Index was one did you have a great chance of having a uh, good corruption perceptions index score. And that even when you just dropped down to two on the Freedom House score, and all the way across, it was pretty much bunched between two and four on the corruption perceptions index. And so therefore, you have this pretty steep curve. And what that would imply is that a country has to make 
quite significant gains on freedom, going in fact perhaps all the way up to a one on the Freedom House score, before it can make really significant gains on corruption. And I'm wondering what you think about that interpretation of that particular slide. All right, why don't we take one more, uh, uh, go ahead, Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn Huber, I have a question for uh, Luis Chirinos. Uh, the problem with civil society, of course, is the problem of aggregation. In other words, if I look at significant reforms, they are typically driven by political parties. Uh, in other words, the, the danger with civil society is different groups want different things, and then it becomes very hard to uh, kind of uh, get a coherent programmatic change. My question is simply, are there any examples so far of important civil society-driven legislative changes? Sure. Um, those are some good questions. Um, regarding the question um, of privatization as being a, um, a source of corruption, that is certainly uh, not unique to Peru. That has happened in many countries. Russia is a very good, well, uh, good example of that as well. Um, and it kind of, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, because it does get to one of those uh, not very well understood notions. I mean, when I was talking about some of the institutional reforms that might help in reducing corruption, I did mention reducing opportunities. And privatization is sometimes seen as a way of taking things out of the control of public official hands and therefore reducing opportunities for corruption. But um, what we've seen is that um, privatization without certain kinds of um, controls and account accountability mechanisms, without a a uh, pretty well-developed market economy with lots of competition um, often ends up being uh, privatization of corruption, as you mentioned, you know, going from public sector corruption to more private sector corruption and, and a whole lot of grand corruption um, thrown into the process. So, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to point that out as a, as a, as a key problem that um, market reforms are just not an easy sort of panacea, um, you know, in terms of uh, reducing corruption. There's um, the, Certainly, like in, in other areas as well, with liberalization and, and sort of um, banking reforms, deregulation, there's um, a real imperative to put in um, some, some controls and oversight and to have some basic kinds of co competition uh, in, within, within the industry, within sectors, in order for those market type reforms to work the way they're intended. So I thought that was a very good point you raised. Uh, regarding the MCC data, um, I, um, the way I would think of it um, in terms of corruption is that a, a lot of countries um, you know, need to show sort of good governance or performance on corruption in order to be candidates for, um, for um, assistance through the MCC. And, um, you know, the data could show that, con you know, countries that in fact are, um, uh, perf you know, performing better on, on governance could also be performing better in their use of assistance dollars and therefore having the, you know, improvements in the economy and in the health and education sectors wherever the dollars are being spent. Um, I wasn't thinking of that as being um, key to what I was trying to show in this presentation, but certainly it could could be data that would be useful, usefully mined for that purpose. Um, and then regarding Blair's very insightful uh, uh, comment on the relationship um, that was shown in that slide on the Corruption Perception Index and the Freedom House, I'm impressed you were able to um, kind of see that in such a short amount of time that it was shown on the, on the screen. I agree um, with your kind of um, analysis that the, the significant gains um, to corruption really come um, after you've after you've made a huge um, movement on the freedom score on the freedom score. Now, what um, I would say from my looking at the data a little more closely, uh, it's not just you don't just have to have a score of one. Even going from what even even in the category of uh, two on freedom gives you 
kind of significant um, gains on corruption. But I would agree that instead of a straight line, a better mapping of uh, the data points would show a pretty steep curve. And uh, if I had had a little bit more time and had been a little bit more sophisticated, I probably would have tried to show that. Anything else, Phyllis? No? No. I think that's it. Mike? Uh, I didn't talk too much about corruption. Uh, certainly that's one of the main criticisms of decentralization in Indonesia is that it has shifted corruption out to the regions. But as with so many other things about decentralization, I mean, we lack a baseline to actually say anything meaningful about that. I think that there was certainly a lot of corruption there before, and uh, there just are very poor data to actually measure it or provide any estimates for it. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, Evelyn poses a very uh, important problem. What I, I surely think that uh, most legislation is promoted by political parties. However, in a way, uh, we can say that these um, uh, parties assuming propo uh, legislative process, uh, <coughs> uh, proposals uh, are in, is in a way a, a result of their capacity or incapacity to uh, pick up from regional movements, civil society organizations, you no know, proposals. That on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, even though it's uh, a very uh, uh, the, the key problem of civil society organizations is the aggregation. No, I think the there have there have been experiences of political incidents. There is a promotion of legislation by civil society organizations at the regional level, and that is what I I think I, I didn't clearly pass. The fact that at the national level, you know, the uh, approval of legislation, uh, democratic re uh, reforms and rights, is uh, not negotiated with civil society. Whereas at the regional level and at the local level, you know, many of the provisions, re restricted provisions of the law, of the national law, have been modified in, in, in de facto, you no? Know, by civil society inputs to regional authorities and, and, and regional and local authorities. For example, the law requires that uh, every organization that participates in, in a participatory budget has to have uh, legal registration, personería jurídica, we call it. Hmm? And that's the law. If you don't have it, and that is 98% probably of civil society organizations of the poorer sectors, you, know, you can participate. The, what they have done in accord with the negotiating with the regional and local authorities has been, we will set aside this record site. Hmm? And other changes have been promoted also in providing resources, regional and local resources to the oversight committees over the participatory budget, which is not contemplated in the law, and the combination of territorial organizations with thematic organizations in order to, as, as, as beneficiaries of the right. No? So there has been uh, um, these uh, experiences that have given, at the national level, the possibility to present projects of law to modify the national law. Hmm? So I would say this is a, 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 an aggregative process, but in the vertical uh, sense, no? coming from down below to above. I think we have a little time left for another round of questions. Is uh, Steve? Steve Webb. Steve Webb, the World Bank. Uh, and a question for, for Phyllis, following up on, on Blair's in a way, uh, and that is uh, this correlation that you mentioned between um, uh, democracy and, and corruption, a negative correlation. Also, other people, uh, and you mentioned that without a graph, correlation between, uh, negative correlation between corruption and growth. Uh, 
in most cases that I, I've seen, if you take out the countries that are developed countries, the ones that became democratic, rich, and not corrupt sometime between 1800 and 1950, in, in various orders, if you, if you just look at developing countries, uh, that those correlations disappear. Um, and similarly, for the, for the countries joining the European Union, I, I mean, I think there, uh, the European Union, as you pointed out, was, was requiring them to reduce corruption and requiring them to reduce to, to introduce democracy. But that doesn't mean that the two were causing each other. It means that it, it shows that the European Union was requiring both, but, but it doesn't mean that one was necessarily causing the other. And so the, the question that, I, that, that besides those questions, the, the other question I want to ask is, um, are, are we understanding better what aspects of corruption? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's thrown out as a, as a general term, as if it, all corruption is the same, but we know that it's not. What aspects of corruption are, are bad for development, economic development or democratic development or social development? Because there are a lot of varieties of corruption, uh, and I'm not sure we're understanding which kinds are, are problematic and which kinds are maybe much less problematic. Jennifer, did you have a question? Actually, it builds a lot on the last question from the last round, but I, I was just very interested in what seemed to be very contrasting cases between Indonesia and, uh, and Peru, because Indonesia is an example where really the institutional reforms seem to have followed the practice and, and what was already momentum. Um, whereas in Peru, the political parties have created this decentralization law, but in many parts in the, in the regions, it hasn't really had a great impact on, uh, on civil society because the incentive structures aren't there and there are a lot of barriers. And so I just wonder, um, and I invite both of you to comment on what, what does this mean for external efforts to try to intervene to promote democratization and decentralization? Since the title of the panel is Continuing Institutional Challenges, what can we do if the, the better examples that we have are about following momentum that exists? Thanks. It's Jennifer Brinkerhoff at George Washington University. John? Thank you, John Fino, RTI International. Um, in reference to Stephen Webb's question, I find it very curious in talking about types of corruption. Um, my question has to deal with in, in thinking about types of corruption or in how the state can deal with corruption. One, and I, I pardon me if this seems like an external criticism, I know you only had 20 minutes, but it's interesting to me that the notion of a random bribe here, a random bribe there versus more systematic corruption. So for instance, the notion of criminality the state almost becoming a co-sponsor of criminality, whether it's drug trafficking, whether it's other sorts of illegal activities where, in effect, those illegal activities operate because the state, through via, through, uh, via corruption, turns a blind eye or, in some cases, even sponsors it in a, in a covert way. So I guess... Um, my question has to do with thinking more in terms of the sources of corruption versus just simply the institutional arrangements to stop it. Anybody else? Okay, let me go ahead. Okay, I'll see, you, I'll see what I can do. Um, kind of ch some challenging questions here. Regarding, uh, I guess, Steve's question, there are a few different parts to it. Um, but certainly the notion of taking the OECD countries out of the uh, data, just looking at LDCs and what kind of relationship do you see, um, uh, kind of a shorthand way to do that, even just uh, thinking of the graph that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, um, kind of shows there is not a great um, relationship between, say, corruption and democracy. And in fact, when I was pointing out the countries um, in the threes and fours on the Freedom House scale is falling even below that, that straight line. Um, there's, you could make the argument that countries that are actually in transition do more poorly 
on corruption that, that in some ways you could almost go, they, um, if, if you were to really to, to graph it, you know, we, start, we talked about that steep curve. In a way, there's a, um, there's a steep curve that goes down, and then it actually comes up a little bit when you get to the more authoritarian countries and goes down a bit. So in a way, if you think of that, it's just a correlation. It doesn't really show sequencing over time. If it does suggest what a real sequence would look like for a country, um, it might say, oh, if, you, if you're authoritarian and there aren't many reforms, you might, uh, and then you try to liberalize, you might actually go through a period of increasing corruption in the initial phases of liberalization in the economic and the democratic realms before you um, see any progress uh, in terms of corruption levels as you get a little bit more um, free, more democratic. Um, that's kind of that's kind of sketchy. That's kind of taking a lot. That's ex extrapolating quite a bit, even from that data. But also from, I guess, from um, what I would say from my knowledge of the literature would be um, uh, something something along those lines. And I think you're also getting at the notion of uh, corruption and growth, and what is the relationship if you took out the OECD countries, and um, that does bring up the issue of different kinds of corruption which I'm glad you brought up. I mean, it's hard to do, it's hard to really get into depth when you're talking about a corruption and democracy in 20 minutes, but there have been a whole, um, there's been a whole lot of ways to distinguish between different kinds of corruption, and I guess if you're going to talk about growth, one of the key distinctions is sort of predictable versus unpredictable corruption, um, whether it's organized and systematized versus more anarchic or chaotic. Um, World Bank has actually done some very good work showing that the unpredictable, disorganized, anarchic kind of corruption certainly has a greater deleterious impact on growth than the more organized, systematized 